Don't tell me words don't matter. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. And the way to make government accountable is make it transparent so that the American people can know exactly what decisions are being ma made, how they're being made, and whether their interests are being well served. Let me say it as simply as I can. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. In fact, since taking office, this has been the administration that's prosecuted more whistleblowers in two years than in the preceding 40 years, that meets with lobbyists across the street from the White House so they don't have to disclose their meeting with lobbyists, and, this is true, censored nearly 200 pages of internal emails about their efforts to make government more transparent. How weird has this administration's record on transparency gotten? President Obama received an award for transparency Monday. That meeting was completely closed to members of the media. They not only closed the meeting to the media, they didn't even put it in the president's public schedule. I believe that every single American has the right to affordable, accessible health care. But these negotiations will be on C-SPAN. It'll be televised on C-SPAN. It's on C-SPAN. On C-SPAN. On C-SPAN. C-SPAN founder and CEO Brian Lamb tells The Daily Caller that C-SPAN's cameras need more access in Congress. Would you have liked to see C-SPAN in the negotiations to see what was going on behind closed doors? The president said that we're all going to be on C-SPAN. He never asked us. This prompted C-SPAN to send a formal letter to Congress today. They are requesting, once again, full camera access to all of the relevant negotiations to how our health care system will be changed in this country. Brian Lamb, the founder of C-SPAN, is urging Senate Leader Harry Reid and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, along with the President, to allow the public full access. Well, just lastly, why can't you answer the C-SPAN question? I did. Well, you didn't because you, uh, said, you said I said I hadn't seen the letter, which well, I have. Why do you need to see a letter? I mean, this is something the well, president said during the, the campaign, and yeah, you talked about he wants everything open on C-SPAN. Dan asked me about the letter, and I, I haven't read the letter, so well, I I'll wanted just to ask you about no, no, having I, it on C-SPAN. I understand. And I, I answered Dan's question, and I answered this. Uh, uh, a lot of reasons not to do it on C-SPAN. People could show vote. Does he regret making that statement during the campaign? No. If you have insurance that you like, then you will be able to keep that insurance. If you've got a doctor that you like, you will be able to keep your doctor. Nobody is trying to change what works. Uh, but I don't think we're going to be able to eliminate employer coverage immediately. There's going to be potentially some transition process. I can envision a decade out or 15 years out or 20 years. If you're one of the more than 250 million Americans who already have health insurance, you will keep your health insurance. This law will only make it more secure and more affordable. It's just untrue. A lot of employers are going to drop their health insurance coverage to dump people on the government-run exchanges. One of the concerns about health care and how you pay for it, one-third of the funding comes from cuts right. uh, to Medicare. Right. It is important for us to make sure this thing is deficit neutral, without tricks, I said I wouldn't sign a bill that didn't meet that criteria. They used 10 years of revenues uh, and seven years of spending and said, see, look, over 10 years, this pays for itself. He's cutting Medicare by $500 billion. He cut seniors' home health care by 11%. It's a plan that asks everyone to take responsibility for meeting this challenge. Everybody. Exempting some from complying with the new health care law. They've been granted a special waiver from key provisions of the new law. All this coming out in just the first two years. This plan will reduce the cost of health care for millions. Instead, they've gone up by 2,200. Premiums, I think, have gone up 9%. It still leaves 23 million people uninsured. Let, let me also uh, address an illegitimate concern that's being put forward by those who are claiming that a public option is somehow a Trojan horse for a single-payer system. A single-payer Healthcare plan, universal healthcare plan. That's what I'd like to see. Uh, I think if we get a good public option, it could lead to single payer, and that's the best way to reach single payer. Nobody is talking about some government takeover of healthcare. I happen to be a proponent of a single payer universal healthcare plan. And that should never be purchased with tax increases on middle class families. It may be, but it's still that's a tax increase. That, that, no, no that, that, that's not true, George. The, 
for us to say that you've got to take a responsibility to get health insurance is absolutely not a tax increase. No, but, but George, you, you can't just make up that language and decide that that's called a tax increase. I don't think I'm making it up. Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Tax, a charge usually of money imposed by authority on persons or property <laughs> for public purposes. George, the fact that you looked up Merriam's dictionary, the, the definition of tax increase indicates to me that you're stretching a little bit right now. But you reject that it's a tax I increase. I absolutely reject that notion. But if Obamacare isn't a tax, why did the president's lawyers tell the Supreme Court it is a tax? If they don't pay the tax, they violated a federal law. But as long as they've paid the penalty. If they've paid the tax, then they're in compliance with the law. An extraordinary decision out of the Supreme Court this morning said this is, in effect, a tax. They flipped the position lawmakers have been taking and insisted that the Affordable Care Act was a tax increase. Chief Justice Roberts agreed with the government's position that the, quote, shared responsibility payment under the Affordable Care Act is a tax and not a penalty. And Obamacare doesn't have just one tax. It has more than 20 Obamacare tax hikes. That is why Obama didn't want us to know about the Obamacare taxes until it was too late. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. So many people said, you know, back in August 09, we were all saying this seemed to be a tax. And if it was a tax, then this was going to be the largest tax increase in history. He broke that promise by implementing Obamacare. We're going to see, as you already mentioned, $500 billion in taxes, the biggest tax hike in American history. And I can make a firm pledge under my plan, no family making less than $250,000 a year will see any form of tax increase. Not your income tax, not your payroll tax, not your capital gains taxes, not any of your taxes. But the president of the campaign said that he made a flat pledge that he would not raise taxes well, on anybody making under 250. So is that pledge still operable? Well, I, again, I think uh, I think in some ways uh, your question is uh, hypothetical because there are any number of different bills, uh, different proposals. I think the president has outlined what he believes is the very best way to pay for health care. Hypothetical. He made a pledge. He said, I'm, I'm not going to raise taxes on anyone I'm making under 250. Mm -hmm. Is that pledge still active? Uh, we are going to let the process work its way through. So it's not. So it's not. We're going to let the process work its way through. All right. If you make under $250,000, you will not see your taxes increase by a single dime. Not your income tax. Not your payroll tax. Not your capital gains tax. You have, however, said you would favor an increase in the capital gains tax. As a matter of fact, you said on CNBC, and I quote, I certainly would not go above what existed under Bill Clinton, which was 28%. It's now 15%. That's almost a doubling if you went to 28%. But actually, Bill Clinton in 1997 signed legislation that dropped the capital gains tax to 20%. Right. And George Bush has taken it down to 15%. Right. And in each instance, when the rate dropped, revenues from the tax increased. The government took in more money. And in the 1980s, when the tax was increased to 28%, the revenues went down. So why raise it at all? Well, Charlie, what I've said is that I would look at raising the capital gains tax for purposes of fairness. I believe that this country succeeds when everyone gets a fair shot, when everyone does their fair share when everyone plays by the same rules. It means making sure that the biggest corporations pay their fair share in taxes. That's why I've asked Congress to close some of the biggest tax loopholes exploited by some of our most profitable corporations to avoid paying their fair share, or in some cases, paying taxes at all. It's not right to ask middle class families to pay more for college 
before we ask the biggest corporations to pay their fair share of taxes. CBS News reports that in January, President Obama named General Electric CEO Jeffrey Immelt to head the President's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. Obama's choice of Immelt came under scrutiny this past week in the wake of a front-page story in the New York Times, which reported that despite $14.2 billion in worldwide profits, including more than $5 billion from U.S. operations, GE did not owe taxes in 2010. Carney was asked why, if the president wants corporate tax reform, he appointed, quote, to the head of the Competitiveness and Jobs Council, a person who is now the poster child for abusing the system to get out of paying taxes. The Recovery Act and our actions to fix the financial system were decisive in starting to turn the economy around. Our economy is stronger that economic heartbeat is growing stronger. All of them have projects that are shovel-ready. Shovel-ready projects. Shovel-ready projects. We are seeing shovels hit the ground. Shovel-ready was not as uh, <laughs> shovel-ready as we expected. Under my plan uh, of a cap-and-trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Coal-powered plants, you know, natural gas, you name it, whatever the plants were, whatever the industry was, they would have to uh, retrofit their operations. That will cost money. They will pass that money on to consumers. So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. President Obama is facing new criticism over supporting offshore drilling in Brazil while continuing to back very tough restrictions right here in the U.S. And the Obama administration is going to lend at least $2 billion to a Brazilian state-owned oil company to finance drilling off that country's shores. Meanwhile, our federal government, the Obama administration, has virtually shut down the Gulf of Mexico. In 2009, Barack Obama said, I'm pledging to cut the deficit by half by the end of my first term in office. And for them to say that we shouldn't be raising uh, the debt ceiling is irresponsible. The way Bush has done it over the last eight years, number 43 added $4 trillion by his lonesome. That's irresponsible. It's unpatriotic. For a long time, I sat between the two graves and wept. The pain I felt was my father's pain. My questions were my brother's questions. Their struggle, my birthright. We are all shaped by our pasts, and we carry elements of the past into the future. But we have to be careful because nothing can rob the future quite as much as the debts of the past. 